All right. And I'm going to talk about um, the role of inflammation and uh, cancer, um, uh, sort of preventative during treatment and in terms of survivorship. And the reason why I'm talking about inflammation is because it's, it's one of the uh, most well-researched uh, areas of nutrition and cancer. And I've uh, cited some studies uh, throughout my presentation. Um, but first I want you to just think a little bit, uh, and I know lunch is following this presentation, so it's good timing, um, about how many plants, and, and I, plants I think of, of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, how many plant foods you've eaten over the last couple days. Just, just give a thought to that. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about what is chronic inflammation versus acute inflammation and how does it contribute to cancer cell growth and what can you do to minimize inflammation and basically this is what we're going to cover is eating a lot of plant foods, uh, maintaining a healthy weight, minimizing alcohol consumption, perhaps increasing uh, foods higher in omega-3 fatty acids, and drinking plenty of fluids. Now, I realize many of you may have um, variations in your kidney function, and um, so there might be some particular things that you need to limit, like phosphorus, <laughs> potassium, protein. Um, but in general, I'm going to talk about the bigger picture on how food can imp impact um, the chronic inflammatory process within the body. So first of all, I'd like to kind of review that um, some of the in influencers that uh, on cancer cell growth, and in this slide in the center is a cancer cell, and they are not, as we know, not like normal cells. And this is um, from um, the uh, publication cell uh, done in 2011. And cancer cells are very persnickety. They can evade our body's um, normal um, processes to suppress their growth. Um, and currently, and I say currently because one doesn't know what science will discover, uh, but currently this uh, tumor-promoting uh, inf inflammatory process, and I guess I could use this. There we go. Um, this tumor-promoting inflammatory process is where what we eat um, comes into play. And so that's what we're going to further examine. So what's the difference between short-term and chronic inflammation? This is conjunctivitis, and this is an acute inflammatory process where you um, might have to have some antibiotic drops or something to help clear it up, but it will resolve. Whereas chronic inflammation is something that occurs within our body that we don't necessarily know that it's going on, but it, it, it's a continual process, and our body can't turn it off, but we can mitigate it and um, slow it down. Um, infl inflammation is basically, it's, it's part of the aging process, but it also contributes to many chronic diseases, cancer included, um, rheumatoid arthritis, um, um, cardiovascular disease. So by following a, kind of an anti-inflammatory type diet, of which we'll talk about today, you're actually going to address many chronic diseases. And I think, I kind of think about the chronic inflammatory process as one of disorganization, uh, like that chaotic picture on the left, whereas uh, an anti-inflammatory state is more organized, um, more functional, uh, like a well-functioning city. And so um, we know that 
chronic inflammation can indirectly enhance tumor formation and that it also contributes to about one third of cancers, some more than others. Um, but in this slide, um, you see that there are some pathways identified, um, NF, kappa, beta, STAT3, COX2. These are inflammatory pathways within the body. And there's actual um, impact of food compounds uh, on suppressing these inflammatory pathways, not quite as actively as something like an ibuprofen or an anti-inflammatory medication, but nonetheless, what you eat does become you and does integrate into your cellu cellular structure. Uh, for example, um, curcumin, which is a compound within the root turmeric, which is a plant, it's a root, has been very highly studied and probably more so than many compounds within foods. And curcumin actually blocks uh, the NF-kappa-beta pathway and the COX-2 pathway as does cinnamon and cloves uh, can block this COX-2 pathway. And again, there are some um, anti-therapy, medica anti-cancer medications that also act on these pathways, probably with more vigor than foods, but nonetheless, um, how you eat does matter. And there's uh, studies on whole soy and green tea. The ingredient in whole soy is genstein, and what is in green tea are catechins. Um, and those compounds have been shown to suppress various um, inflammatory pathways as well. So all plant foods have these compounds, and they're formed by um, the process of photosynthesis within um, the plant. So. Um, patients, you know, often ask me, well, what should I eat more of? And I just tell them that they need to eat a variety of plants because it's not just blueberries or broccoli or Brussels sprouts or sweet potatoes, but it's also white potatoes and um, cantaloupe and peaches, they all, all plants have these anti-inflammatory compounds and it's actually more important to eat the plants versus worry about whether they're organic or not. It's more important to get the nutrients and um, you want to get the, you want to consume the food in more of its whole form. It can be cooked or raw, but if you're going to cook it, you want to uh, consume the nutrients in the water that you're cooking it in, like as in soup or either roast or steam, so that a lot of those anti-inflammatory compounds are not lost into the water. So, okay, what can you do to minimize inflammation? Um, well, eat a plant-focused diet. And, and that doesn't mean that you can't eat some animal products too. And, and I actually encourage people to have some um, animal protein as well. But um, eating a plant-focused diet really does contribute to redu reductions in chronic inflammation. So as you kind of looked at or thought about what you eat, um, you should try to consume at least five servings of non-starchy vegetables and fruits a day. And, you know, that's probably why a lot of people choose to juice or eat or drink smoothies because for some people it's really hard to consume that much um, in the way of fruits and vegetables. And juicing is just fine unless you've got issues of diabetes or uh, diarrhea or um, hyperglycemia for some reason, and then juicing might not be such a good idea. But um, I always recommend eating the whole food because the fiber is really important because it feeds your gut bacteria, and the gut bacteria is part of your immune system. As a matter of fact, it's about 70% 
of our immune system. We have millions of types of bacteria within our gut and eating more plants, um, well, because the plants have more fiber that we can't digest, that fiber is the food for the bacteria. And um, again, that helps support our immune system. So that's why I suggest to eat the whole food versus juicing. So you've heard this before, and I know you can't read it because it's too small, but all colors of fruits and vegetables offer something, and they all contribute to reductions in chronic inflammation within the body. So trying to eat at least five servings, and a serving is like a piece of fruit or a cup of raw vegetables versus a half cup of cooked vegetables. So you do have to think about it in order to, to get it. Um, and I, I mentioned already that plant foods are higher in fiber, so um, this is another mechanism of how plants can decrease chronic inflammation. Um, higher, a higher fiber diet in general decreases the absorption of carbohydrate from the meal, which uh, reduces the amount of insulin that your body um, puts out in order to get the glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cells. And there is a relationship with inflammation and insulin and something called insulin growth factor one. And when people, I answer this probably four or five times a day, people ask, well, I can't eat sugar, right? Because sugar feeds cancer. And I'll say, well, um, everything we eat changes into glucose, amino acids, triglycerides, and fatty acids. And so we can't really do much about that. And we know that cancer cells can utilize glucose for fuel. They can utilize amino acids for fuel. They can utilize ketones, which are byproducts of fat metabolism for fuel. And in 2016, um, we don't have a way to um, impact that significantly. So the role of sugar and, and or glucose and cancer cell growth is more related to the amount of insulin required. It, it, for example, if you eat like an apple versus a couple cookies, the carbohydrate content is about the same, but within the apple there are nutrients there that decrease chronic inflammation, whereas the couple cookies don't have those same nutrients. But once you consume them, the impact on your glucose level is about the same. So it's just a question of getting more for your buck with the, with the fruits and vegetables. Um, so, and the other thing about a higher fiber diet, uh, besides decreasing uh, insulin and insulin growth factor one, is that it can also decrease like um, estrogen levels, which are more applicable for breast cancer, but um, the fiber is, is a good thing. And plants are very high in antioxidants, and in general, antioxidants protect cells uh, uh, from damage, um, and that's why we don't typically like people to take a lot of antioxidant supplements during treatment. Um, it's a bit of a theoretical argument, um, but there isn't a lot of data saying that it's beneficial to take supplemental antioxidants, so we kind of err on the side of caution and say uh, antioxidants from food are absolutely fine, um, but the plants do contain a lot of antioxidants like the carotenoids, the flavonoids, um, sulfur compounds from the cruciferous vegetables like um, you know, broccoli, cauliflower, arugula, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Those are quite well researched and have a lot of benefits in terms of um, uh, anti-inflammatory activity. And the carotenoids are also known to promote cell-to-cell -cell communication. And, and that's essentially also related to this uh, decrease in inflammation is when the cells are communicating with each other um, at 100%, then cells that are irregular, such as cancer cells, 
uh, can't get such a good foothold within the body. So essentially nutrition is about keeping um, the healthy organism functioning at 100%, uh, either in terms of prevention, treatment, or, and as a survivor. Legumes are also plant, uh, of course, from plants, and they're a great source of plant proteins, uh, very high in minerals, um, calcium, fiber, um, magnesium, and so we encourage people to eat more non-meat meals, non-animal meals. Uh, a website that you might want to visit is called meatlessmonday.com and that's versus Meatless Mondays, which is a political website. <laughs> I made that mistake once. And I, so it's meatlessmonday.com and they have a lot of recipes for um, uh, legume-based uh, dishes. So this diagram here actually uh, shows us how the nutrients in soy, which is genstein, and, and green tea, which is the catechins, actually block the inflammatory process and slow down the um, oxidative damage of, of prostate cancer to develop, or, or like if you have prostatitis or something, uh, which is kind of an inflammatory um, condition, uh, you'd have to take antibiotics to get rid of that, but long term, um, Inflammation plays a role in, in prostate cancer, and so with more fruits and vegetables, you can decrease that inflammatory role and decrease the progression to prostate cancer. And I did mention about gut bacteria and um, how um, the fiber in the diet uh, can help contribute to the proliferation of um, gut bacteria that interact in a positive way with our body. And it's quite um, an element of study currently. The gut microbiome, I've, I've heard several speakers in this very room talking about the gut microbiome and, and its impact on our overall health and how it might impact uh, colon cancer specifically, intestinal cancers, but then overall our general health. I did mention that this is, a, again, this is a picture of a turmeric root, and um, a lot of people use powdered turmeric, which is fine. It's the curcumin within the turmeric that's the active anti-inflammatory compound. Um, there's not, so there are curcumin supplements out there, um, but the absorption rate of curcumin isn't very good, uh, and so, we encourage people to eat food that has turmeric in it because all components within food are enhanced when you eat it with other foods. There's a synergistic relationship. Um, so if you like Indian food, turmeric, you know, is, is a very um, uh, essential component of many Indian dishes. Um, I encourage you to eat that. If you don't like it, don't worry. Turmeric and curcumin is just one of those anti-inflammatory compounds. All plants have those same or similar compounds. Cinnamon, again, um, is something, cloves, any other type of herb, they also play a part in decreasing these inflammatory pathways within the body. Maintaining a healthy weight decreases inflammation because your body just functions better. Um, and again, excess body weight is associated with insulin resistance, which cause insulin resistance is, causes an increased amount of insulin to be produced within the pancreas, and that triggers that insulin growth factor one, and that is the cancer-promoting compound. So the leaner you are, the less insulin that your body needs to produce in order to get the glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cells where it belongs. And um, also, um, 
Adipose tissue is the main site of estrogen production in postmenopausal women, so again, a contributor for breast cancer development. Um, obesity is, is related to many types of cancer, um, uh, kidney cancer included, um, and most likely because of that inflammatory process. Um, fat cells produce hormones, including leptin, and increased leptin may promote cell proliferation and blood vessel development while inhibiting the programmed cell death, which is um, what is dysregulated in cancer cell growth. I mean, normal cells, they have a certain lifespan, uh, whereas cancer cells are very cagey and figure out ways to live longer than they should. And another um, area here is with increased fat cells, there's a reduced amount of a hormone called adiponectin, which is protective, and it decreases insulin resistance and inflammation. And adiponectin promotes programmed cell death. So there's a couple uh, relationships there that um, increased um, mostly abdominal fat, um, is something that you want to try to work on. So being obese is also associated with a constant state of low-grade chronic inflammation that can promote cancer development. And um, there are clear associations with the obesity with breast, pancreas, colon, and endometrial cancers. So the reason why, there's a few things, but these are the main components of why uh, it's good to be as lean of a version of yourself as you can be, and it's because of these compounds and their impact on cancer cell growth. The insulin growth factor one, leptin, um, abdominal fat, and estrogen, which isn't ap applicable for the kidney cancer population, but nonetheless, um, it's well known. So maintaining a healthy weight and, you know, you don't have to be uh, extremely thin. Um, five to 10 pounds of weight loss, if, if, if you have it to lose, is helpful and shows improvement in the inflammatory, in the inflammatory markers. So um, you don't have to go to great extents uh, of weight loss. And why limit alcohol? Um, a lot, a lot of it is because it contributes to fat cell formation and for the hormone-related hormone, um, cancers like breast cancer or prostate cancer, um, it, again, it contributes to fat cell production which can drive hormone um, production as well. Um, so not as applicable in kidney cancer. But nonetheless, um, it's something that your kidneys would process if you chose to consume it. And we know that it's, an, it's inflammatory to the mucosa of the intestinal tract. Um, and so there's a lot of study on you know, the, the relationship between alcohol and intestinal cancers. We hear a lot of, about omega-3 fatty acids and they're generally thought to be anti-inflammatory. Um, they're found in um, dark green leafy vegetables and in plant fats primarily and in fatty fish. And of course there's fish oil supplements, there's flax oil supplements. Um, interestingly, um, there's, about as much there's about as much research promoting uh, omega-3 fatty acids as saying that they really don't show that much benefit. Um, so I don't typically recommend additional supplemental uh, fish oil or flaxseed oil. Um, I recommend that you get it through food. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are there is some body of, of data that supports an anti-inflammatory uh, mechanism with more omega-3 fatty acids, and it's possibly due to the fact that in general, um, our, if we're eating a typical American diet, which 
which I'm encouraging you not to do, um, it, uh, we have a higher amount of omega-6 fatty acids versus omega-3. Omega-3 are the more anti-inflammatory ones. And the reason why we have more omega-6 is because our agricultural patterns in the United States have developed so that our animals are consuming more corn and soy products, which are higher in the omega-6 category. And of course, that becomes what is in their tissue, and we eat it, and then it becomes us as well. So this is the selling point for the grass-fed animal products, which are of course higher in cost, um, but if they're eating alfalfa and uh, uh, flax seeds, etc., they're going to have a higher omega-3 fatty acid composition and, should, and, and will contribute to our own uh, increase in omega-3 fatty acid consumption. The other, um, another interesting thing about omega-3 fatty acids is that they uh, can protect against the shortening of the telomeres at the end of our chromosomes, uh, which is a process that's been identified as a marker of cell aging and associated with cancer risk. So an anti-inflammatory diet is, is the same as a, as a kind of an anti-aging diet because infl inflammation is something that increases as we age, but we can combat it with how we eat, how we live, and also I, I'm not talking a lot about exercise, but exercise is definitely a very important part in managing chronic inflammation. So eating foods rich in omega-3 fatty acids, um, dark green leafies, cold water fish, uh, nuts, seeds, um, grass-fed meats, dairy products from grass-fed animals, omega-3 eggs. Eat them in moderation uh, because they're high in calories. Even though they're healthy fats, the calories are higher than normal. You can use this to your advantage if you're trying to maintain your weight and struggling with weight loss. Um, use the right oil for the job. Uh, this is probably why coconut oil is so popular these days. It's not a panacea. Um, coconut oil is, it doesn't contribute to our body's uh, production of cholesterol, but it, the real selling point for coconut oil is that it can handle high heat cooking. And if you're going to saute or use a wok, you want to use an oil that can handle the high heat because some oils that are quite healthy, like olive oil, they break down with high heat. And I'll just wrap up here. Um, some ways to add um, anti-inflammatory foods. Let's see. Drinking more fluids. That's another way to reduce inflammation because it allows our own bodies to detoxify. And we don't need any detoxifiers, really. Um, our body has its own system that works quite well um, through our skin, through our lung, livers, liver, kidneys, and our intestinal tract. And as long as we're well hydrated and our organs are functioning, um, our body will rid itself of the compounds of food metabolism that we need to get rid of. So no need to detoxify. We do it quite effectively ourselves. Um, and I'll just kind of summarize here. Um, so an anti-inflammatory diet, eat mostly plants, maintain a healthy weight. It doesn't have to be, um, if you're overweight now, it doesn't have to be a lot of weight loss to show improvement. Five to 10 pounds shows improvement in, in inflammatory markers. Minimize alcohol consumption. Increase omega-3 fatty acids and drink plenty of fluids. And I've got maybe time for one or two questions. Thank you. I've tried to do a lot of reading about what you were talking about today, but I've always been confused about the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. Mm -hmm. And do I have the impression that in our typical American diet, we get 
too much omega-6 in correct. ratio to omega-3. Yes. yes. So we should strive to increase the omega-3 omega mm -hmm. and, and decrease the omega-6. And you do that by eating more plants okay. and, if, and kind of decreasing the consumption of traditional agricultural raised uh, animal products. Yeah. Um, it's that simple. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you do for protein? You're sick and stiff or fresh. Can you eat red meat like once a month? Oh, okay. Well, um, red meat in general is um, more correlated for uh, increased risks of uh, intestinal cancers, but three times a week is absolutely fine. And so you can eat chicken, fish, legumes. Or you can be vegan if you want. There's lots of different ways to no, do it. So. Yeah. So um, the so I think the benefit for an anti-inflammatory diet is to increase the amount of plants. Okay. That's the takeaway. One more. Oh well, if there's only one more, I'll give it to her. Okay. But tell us why you don't want fish oil in. Okay. <laughs> and how about yogurt? Oh, yogurt's fine. <laughs> yeah, yogurt's fine. All right, so I'll, I'll stick around if you have questions. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you.